All right, I'd like to welcome everybody to our webinar. My name is Pat Dunn, and I'm uh, joined by Dragan Skropanik, and we are both uh, peer mentors in the Biostatistics 6125 and 8125 courses. So I want to thank everybody for, for uh, participating, and we're going to kind of tag team this. So um, we're going to start with Dragan, and then we'll finish up with, with me. And uh, like I say, you can you can use the chat function, or at the end we'll try to open up for, for questions and answers. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dragan. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Okay, so uh, first we'll just briefly outline what we'll cover uh, tonight here. Uh, we'll talk about concepts. Uh, uh, big emphasis will be on interpretation of the results. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about odds and risk ratios in two by two contingency tables. Uh, we'll address some graphs, cumulative incidents, incident density prevalence, um, about success in this course, quizzes in general, and tests. And then at the end, we'll have a question and answer uh, session. Okay, so uh, interpretation is very important in this course, as you probably have noticed already. Um, use your step-by-step -step guides that you have every week. They are really good models for what you should report and how you should report your results and interpretations. Um, include analysis and explanations of the data that you see in the sample. What is typical, what is expected, and what deviations from, uh, from the expectations do you observe. Uh, when you talk about uh, variability or deviation, you're basically talking about how widely the data vary in measurement and how are the data distributed in relation to the variable or variables that are being measured. Finally, uh, the, main, the main goal of the statistical analysis is the question, have you found a statistically significant relationship, which could sometimes mean a difference uh, or association between um, exposure and outcome. The two important measures uh, when we uh, look at categorical variables, such as exposure and outcome, are the odds ratio and risk ratio. Uh, the odds of exposure in the disease group or exposed group is divided by the odds of exposure in the non-disease group. Uh, we usually abbreviate the odds ratio by OR, and the risk ratio, or the relative risk, we as abbreviated by RR, is the ratio of the risk in the exposed group to the risk in the unexposed group. Most frequently, uh, what we do, uh, we summarize the information in a two-by-two two table. And uh, because in those tables, it's very easy to uh, actually calculate the uh, sample odds ratio or the sample risk ratio. So how is the two-by-two two contingency table organized? Um, there are basically two uh, columns. Well, there are three columns, which you have case, control, and the total. And then you have uh, two rows, um, the exposure, the exposed and unexposed group, and then the total again. So the very first column is the data for group one, basically the cases, those who actually exhibit the, uh, the outcome of the interest. Column two is the data from the second group, the control, those who, uh, those who are not cases. And therefore, they do not they do not exhibit the uh, the outcome of interest. Row one is the uh, those are positive outcomes, all that are um, exposed. And row two are the negative outcomes, though those that were not exposed. Uh, each row and column are added up, and you have uh, the so-called marginal totals, and at the end you have the total sample. Uh, this two by two table is used a lot in applications because it's a really nice summary of, of your findings. The odds ratio, um, it's basically, as we uh, mentioned earlier, is the ratio um, of two things. Uh, what you have in the numerator is the odds for observing the outcome in the exposed group divided by the odds for observing the outcome in the unexposed group. And as you have already observed this formula before, uh, it's A, D divided by B, C. Now, what are the A, A D, and B, and C? Those are, those are exactly the numbers that we saw in the previous slide in the 2 by 2 table. 
So you just cross multiply A times B divided by C or C times B. The risk ratio is a little different. Um, it's the ratio of the risk in the exposed group by, divided by the risk in the unexposed group. So it's really, if you look at the two by two table, uh, you're dividing, uh, you're dividing row-wise, it's the number of cases in the exposed group A divided by the total exposed, which is A plus B, that's your numerator. And then your denominator, uh, the number of cases in the unexposed group, which is C in a two by two table, and then you divide that by C plus D. Uh, the formula looks a little complicated because it is a complex fraction, but it's really not that um, difficult. Um, remember that the odds ratio are used in retrospective studies, but can, they can also be used in prospective studies. The risk ratio is used only in prospective studies because it relies on the incidence. Now you have seen you have seen these uh, formulas before, and this is kind of a good review for the final exam because this will actually show up on the final. Uh, um, you'll be asked, like you've been already asked, to find the confidence interval for the uh, population odds ratio. The first thing is to calculate the standard error for the uh, natural logarithm of the odds ratio, which is the square root of the uh, sum of the reciprocals of your counts that you observed in the two by two table, one over A plus one over B plus one over C plus one over D. Uh, in the second step, uh, what you're going to do, you're going to calculate the 95% confidence interval for the natural logarithm of the odds ratio. So you're going to take the natural log logarithm of the uh, odds ratio and then plus minus 1.96 times the standard error. Finally, to get the 95% confidence interval for the odds ratio, you have to apply the EXP or the E function to get back to the um, original units. Um, as you probably saw in your, one of your application assignments, this is a little, a little tedious. It's easy to make mistakes, so it's really important to be careful here um, and go over your calculations a couple of times to make sure that um, everything is in order. Remember that one is that critical number um, that we are looking for when we are forming this confidence interval. Um, let's move on to the next slide so that we can talk about this a little bit. If, if the odds ratio is actually one or if the risk ratio is one, conclude that there is no association between exposure and outcome. Remember what you're dealing with here. You're dealing with, uh, with a fraction or ratio. And when the fraction is equal to 1, that means that the numerator and the denominator are the same. And if you remember what the definition of the odds ratio was, uh, it will tell you that there is basically no dif If the odds ratio is 1, it will tell you that there is no difference between uh, the risk in the uh, exposed group and the risk in, in the unexposed group. Therefore, there is no association between exposure and outcome. That's why we are really looking carefully when we form that confidence interval, uh, we are really looking to see whether one is included in the confidence interval or not. When we talk about the difference between two means or proportions, the, the number to look for is zero. If you see that number included in the confidence interval, uh, you may conclude that it is plausible that the difference is not statistically significant. Um, in this case, the associated p-value will be greater than 0.05. And the null hypothesis is not rejected. Okay. Uh, keep in mind that failure to reject the null hypothesis does not necessarily mean uh, that the null hypothesis is true. And this actually, um, this is true for what, whatever test you're performing, whether it's one way ANOVA analysis of variance or whether it's an independent sample t-test or a paired sample t-test or a chi-square test, it doesn't matter. Um, the failure to reject the null hypothesis does not imply that the null hypothesis is true. It simply means that you don't have evidence strong enough to conclude otherwise. So be very careful when you interpret that in your, um, in your assignments and on your final exam. Okay, thank you, Dragan. We're going to move into another area now, which are graphs. And so, you know, when we're doing the odds ratio and the risk ratio, we're, <clears throat> we're dealing with numbers. Uh, when we're dealing with graphs, um, it's still numbers, but it's more of a visual representation of those numbers. 
And so I'm going to show you a couple of different types of graphs, and I'm going to actually be brave enough to try an SPSS and show you how to do it. Because frankly, the best way to get good at graphs is just to go into SPSS, or if you use Microsoft Excel or a different program, just go in there and just play around. Just you know, try to the best way to to learn how to make good graphs is just to just to practice and, and do them. Okay, so um, one example is a scatter plot, or uh, it may be referred to as a scatter dot. And this is looking at a, at a uh, relationship between two factors, and you can see the, the, a trend line. You can see if, the, if there's a positive or negative or no correlation between the two. Uh, another one is the box plot, and um, this is where you, you can actually see a lot of the variability in the scores, and you'll actually, I'll show you, you'll actually be able to see um, if there's any outliers uh, represented. Uh, a histogram is going to represent um, one variable um, that's, you know, uh, for you know age or time or temperature, uh, for example. And then a, a bar graph is just another way to organize um, some of your data. So let me give this a try. So you should be able to see on top of the PowerPoint uh, the SPSS. I'm going to start just with a scattered dot using the, the ANSCOM database. So when you're looking, when you're doing graphs, you're always going to go to the graphs um, um, on the menu and go to legacy dialogs. And for a scatter dot, you'll come down to the scatter dot second from the bottom. For our course, you're going to use the simple scatter. You're going to click define. This one's easy because the variables are labeled X and Y. So you're going to put the, you're just going to simply, if the, if the variable is over there, you, would, you can just click and drag the variable. So we have X1 and the X, or Y1 and the Y axis, X1 and the X axis. You always have options for additional options and titles. It's not going to be necessary here. And you're going to click OK. When you do that, you're going to get in your output um, section, you're going to get your, the output of your graph. And so you can see here, you could kind of draw a line at the positive correlation. If it was negative, you know, the trend would be kind of going the opposite direction. And if they're spread out all over the, the screen, then there's probably no correlation at all. Let's look at a box plot. We're going to do the this one here, then go to graphs, legacy dialogs, and we're going to come down to box plot. Simple box plot, click define. I'm going to select age as my variable and income as my category axis. Axis. Click OK. And here's my, my box plot. And that's what I remember what I said about the you can see the variability. If there's a lot of variation, you're going to see much wider boxes, and um, sometimes they call these box and whiskers. You're going to see bigger whiskers. And then you can see how the, the variables uh, are related to one another. I'll give you another example of a scatter. Yeah, we're going to stay in here. Here we have age and income, and here we have it's the same. It looks a little bit differently because you have the you have the rows kind of like a bar chart almost um, for that. You can also you go to the BD one. Scatter dot. We have calculated BMI and age group. Look okay, and look very similar. There. All right. Next one is a histogram. And I'll go back to the graph. Best way to find the database that works best is to go back to the step-by-step -step guides and look at, to see the one that they used. 
All right, so legacy dialogues. Histogram is on the very bottom. I've selected age as my variable. Click OK. And here's my histogram. It even shows you the, the mean standard deviation and the number over here. And you can see it's not exactly a perfectly bell-shaped curve. It's skewed to the, to the left. And finally, I'm going to go back here and create a bar chart. Simple bar. Again, I'm going to use my age group as my axis. Here's my bar chart. So I can see the age distribution in my sample here that I'm getting ready to analyze. So that's just a quick overview on graph. Like I say, just go in and you know, you know, use the data set that you have or use the data sets that are provided in the course and just play around and see what you can come up with. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. Now we're going to go jump back into the, um, um, the some of the key terminology. You know, we're all in um, public health, either in the master's or doctoral program. And these are really key terms to know. If you don't know them now, you're going to have to you're going to have to know them in other courses as you go along. So it's it's good to get a good um, you know base for these. So it's really important to understand the difference between prevalence and incidence. And when we're talking about incidence, there's there's even different types kinds of incidence that we can calculate. So the first one is prevalence. Prevalence is the number of persons in a defined population with a disease with a specific disease or injury. So, you know, when we say there are, you know, 78 million Americans with high blood pressure, that's the prevalence. That doesn't mean 78 million Americans were diagnosed this year. It just simply means there are 78 million. That's the prevalence. That's the number of cases. And if you do it as a fraction, then in that case, it would be the number of cases over the total number. So you'd have to divide that by the, the, um, the population of the United States. The next one is incidence. The incidence is the number of new cases, and that's the key here. It's new cases of persons in a defined population with a specific disease or injury in a given time period. Okay? So this is new cases over the total number. So if we were looking at the the number of people diagnosed this year with diabetes. So we have the total number of people with diabetes that's prevalent, and then the number of new cases would be the incidence. Within incidence, um, and again, it's important, you've already had a quiz on this, and this will come up again in the final, and it'll come up again in other courses. You have the cumulative incidence. The total number of new disease or injury cases during a specific time. Um, death cases are included in cumulative incidence, but they're not included in the prevalence. So the cumulative incidence is the number of new cases over the total people at risk. So they have to be the people at risk. So if you're looking at um, you know, um, the incidence of pregnancy, you would want to be looking at females because males are not in the population, uh, it's not a possibility. So you, you need to look at the total number of, of people that are eligible to, to uh, have that. Um, not, pregnancy is not a disease, but you know what I mean. Um, person time is an estimate of the actual time, um, risk in years, months, or days. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you an example of that in a minute here. So incidence density, that's another way to look at it. That's the frequency of new occurrences during the study period of time. You have your incidence rates, the number of new cases defined over a period of the study. Okay. So let's take a look at how this actually is calculated. Okay. If you go back to week three, there was an example in the step-by-step -step guide. And I'm using this example so that you can actually go back and you can check my math, you can check to see if 
if you understand this, because again, it's really important that you, you are able to figure these out. So we had a case here, we're looking for uh, people that were diagnosed with diabetes. We start with 200 people. At the end of the first year, 160 were left, and 10 of those developed diabetes, okay? So our prevalence is 5%. It's 10 divided by 200, 5%. Because it's year one in our study, and we're assuming that none of the 200 people already had diabetes, then our cumulative incidence is also 5%. It's 10 divided by 200. Now when we look at incidence density, it's a slightly different calculation. We have to use this table up here, okay? So what we are calculating is the person years. So in the table in your step-by-step -step guide, uh, it said that four people were diagnosed in the first quarter, two people were diagnosed in the second quarter, so that's half of a year, and four people were diagnosed in the third quarter, or three quarters of a year. So a total of 10 people were diagnosed, and you just um, multiply by the fraction, so four multiplied by 0.25 equals 1, 2 times 0.5 is also 1, and 4 times 0.75, it should be a point, not a comma, is 3. So when you add your person years up, there were 5 person years, okay? So the incidence density then is we have our 10 cases, and we had of the, you know, there were 190 people that didn't develop diabetes and, <clears throat> and 10 people that did. So the, the person years, um, oh, so the incidence density then is it's 10 divided by the 190, and that gives us an incidence density of 5.1%. Now let's go to year two. If you remember, there were 160 people left at, at the end of year one. At the end of year two, there were 12 new cases, and there were 40 cases lost follow-up or were diagnosed. Okay, so what's the prevalence? It's 22, it's the 10 from year one plus the 12 from year two, divided by the 160, because we've already lo we've lost 40 people now. Okay, so our prevalence is 13.75%. What's the cumulative incidence? We had 12 new cases, and because we had to subtract the 10 that were no longer eligible to be new cases because they were diagnosed, uh, our denominator drops to 190. So 12 divided by the 190 is a cumulative incidence of 6.3%. Now to do our incidence density, we have to, again, go back to our table. There were 20 diagnosed or lost in um, quarter one. So 20 times 0.25 is five. Eight in quarter two, that's four. 12 in quarter three is nine. So we have 40 diagnosed or lost of follow-up, and we had 18 person years. So to calculate the incidence density, okay, it's the 12 new cases divided by 168. Where do we get the 168? It's, we started with 200, we lost 10 in year one, we lost 40 in year two, that drops us down to 150. And then we have to add back in our 18 person years, and that gets us back up to 168. So 12 divided by 168 is 7.1. I know it's kind of confusing, but the more you just practice doing the calculation, um, the easier it's going to be and the, the easier it's going to be uh, you know, down the road in having to figure these out. Okay, so to be successful in the class, to kind of finish up tonight's webinar, a um, couple, of, couple of things. Number one, you know, read the, the reading assignments. Read the textbook. It's, it's always, you know, um, maybe sometimes not convenient to have to read the textbook, but you should always start, start by doing that. Make sure you understand 
um, the basic statistical and biostatistical concepts that are, that are being presented in the text. Make sure that you use the other resources. The step-by-step -step guides are really helpful, especially in doing the application. Um, just you know, look at how the step-by-step -step guide is approaching the problem, and it's going to give you a good guide in, as to how to do your own uh, application. There are SPSS video tutorials um, for most of the weeks, if not all of the weeks, and those are also very helpful in trying to translate the statistical knowledge you're gaining with the use of SPSS. And there are also other resources. There are PowerPoints and other, other documents in the resources. Just you know, use all of those to help you understand um, what, what's going on. And finally, um, seek the, the assistance of your peer mentor. We can help you you know, try to put all this together um, so that it, it starts making sense for you. So that's the end of our prepared. Dragon, do you have any comments on um, class success or any other thing that comes to mind? Um, well, I, I would just want to emphasize to really um, um, look at those uh, weekly step-by-step uh, -step guides save them somewhere on your computer or print them and keep them really keep them handy I mean they're really useful especially as um, you know, when you start uh, you're doing the final uh, it's going to be really useful to have those handy so uh, yeah you know another thing I noticed too is just really read the question sometimes you know I'll get um, messages from some of you where you're you're confused or you're kind of frustrated and when you go back and you, you just read the question and don't try to overinterpret what they're trying to ask you. Just read the question, take it at face value, refer back to the step-by-step -step guide, and and go from there. Um, but you know, sometimes if you just go back and just really read, okay, what are they asking for? You know, what what are they wanting from this this question? Um, make sure you've got the the data set that they're asking for in the in the application, not the one that they used in the step-by-step -step guide. The step-by-step -step guides are are examples, but the problem in the application may be from an entirely different data set. Okay, well I think I'm going to attempt to unmute you all uh, and see if we have any questions. I may get a bunch of back when I do this. Okay, it looks like everybody's uh, unmuted. So does anybody have any questions for us? Uh, I, Patrick, I'm not sure if you could hear me, but I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Yeah, Patrick, I think it's really from Dallas. Uh, yep. You know, the step-by-step guide is great, but uh, the S SPSS video, usually you can, you can, you can barely see it, the, the way it's being done. So. Uh, I usually can figure it out at some point, but uh, I hope, I, you know, in the future we could, we, we could make the video a lot clearer because it's kind of blurry where I'm viewing it. I'm not sure if it's my computer, but I'm using a, a Windows 8 uh, format and it's just uh, blur, uh, blurry. You're saying on the SPSS video tutorial? Yeah. Yeah. I found that to be the case. Um, what I would do, when I took this course, I would literally have the video playing and I would just stop and start, you know, and try to, you know, have a, you know, the screen frozen. The other thing you can do is you can download the text of the video. So if you're having a hard time hearing what he's saying, um, download the, the, the narrative. And sometimes if you have the, the narrative and you have what he's doing on the screen, it's also helpful. Uh, but I, I can appreciate that it's, it is kind of a hard video to, to watch. Uh, they're not very long, though. They're usually only a couple of minutes. Yeah. Patrick, I have a question. This is Shana from New York. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to know, is it like the end of the book, like or end of each chapter, it has like quizzes? Like would you mm -hmm. recommend like doing some of those to try to help us or does that really work or? You know, I don't think it ever hurts to try. 
Um, if, if the quiz gets you more frustrated or more confused, <laughs> then I would back off and, and go back to the step-by-step -step guide. Okay. But especially as you start really start understanding the, the concept, um, you know, I would give that a try. And then with the, with the one other thing, well, one last question. What about the final? Are we going to be provided, like, uh, just like how normally with our quizzes, like where we're going to get the information from for the final? Yeah, the, the final exam works just like the, the weekly applications. It, okay. it is not like the quizzes that are timed. Okay. You're going to get you're going to get your final um, about midweek of week eleven. Okay. And so you'll have about a week and a half, and what what you'll get is uh, you'll get you know a series of questions, and you'll get a um, new data set that you you will download from your um, from Blackboard, and then you'll, you'll answer the questions from those data sets. But you'll have you'll have two full weekends. Well, now we we strongly encourage everybody to get started early. The last thing you want to do, and believe it or not, this has actually happened, of people beginning the, the final exam on the Sunday that it's due. That is definitely not a recommended practice. So, but so you don't have could, to worry about it being timed. OK, perfect. We could, we could actually start the final quiz uh, on the 11th week? Or what's yeah, what? Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can start working on it as soon as it's released. It's going to be released on Wednesday of week 11, usually. So you can start working on, on those questions right away. OK. Yeah, and you'll have, you have about 10 days or so, right? I mean, some, about maybe 11. So, yep. But we recommend start working on this as soon as you can. Because, it, because the, the exam is involved, it's going to take quite a bit of time to actually do it. And, um, you know, problems with technology, they're always there. So, you know, you can always uh, hit some kind of problems. That's why we recommend that you kind of start working on this really early. All right. Yeah, just, it, that's just good to know because it's just um, on the, fir uh, uh, the first few quizzes, uh, and, I, and I didn't even read the, the, the uh, questions, the sample quiz at the end of the chapter. And I just I just read the step by step guide and I, I, I you know my score were, were good but then uh, on the last quiz uh, I attempted to I attempted to uh, uh, answer the questions on the end of the chapter and just made, made it just confused me <laughs> it just uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 that can happen yeah. Now, with the final, though, uh, keep in mind there's only one, uh, one. you're going to be allowed to submit it only once. So that's why you want to be really careful. Uh, you want to start early and you want to check your work as much as you can before submitting. Because once you submit that stuff, it's, you know, you won't have any chance to resubmit anymore. So, so you'll be able to save it? You'll be able to save your, like, if you start, like, the Wednesday, you'll be able to save it to come back to it, like, the next day or a few days yeah, later? Yeah, because you'll be, yeah, you'll yeah. be typing, your, you'll be typing your, your results in a separate uh, Word document. Oh, okay. You're not going to be okay. submitting anything until the very end, until you're really done with the whole exam. Everything, okay. has, to be in, everything has to be showing up in one document. Well, there'll be, I think, five questions or so, right, Pat? Is it five or six? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, so there'll, the be, final there'll be quite a few pages, you know, that, of your work. You know, with the SPSS results and your interpretations, so um, everything has to be saved in one document because you're gonna at the end submit that whole document uh, in in the Blackboard. Oh, so so meaning that we could we could we could save and print the questions and then oh yeah 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 mm -hmm. all right yep. The final works exactly like the weekly applications, where you you know you get the the questions and then you have you know all week and then you 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 submit it. So it's not timed like the quiz. It doesn't matter when you download. You know, there's no there's no time element other than the fact that you have to submit it, you know, you know, by the you know the Sunday of the of week twelve. So so that means that is there's like a the uh, dedicated uh, tab to down, to download the answers or it, it will be an alternate in application.
Say that again. I didn't quite catch that. Yeah, I didn't catch yeah, well, that either. It, what, what did you think? It, it was sub submitting the, our, our, our answers for the uh, final mm -hmm. uh, uh, test. Would it be, is there a dedicated tab to, up, uh, tab to upload hey. our answers? Or there's like a turn it in uh, tab to... It, it's a turn it in. It'll work just like your weekly application. Okay. All right. You'll use a you'll use a Word document. You'll copy or export your output from SPSS, and then you'll type in your interpretation, and then you'll submit that Word document. All right. Got it. Yeah. So, like Dragon said, make sure that because I've done this in the past, I'm notorious for you know I'll do it, and then you know just go back and check your math. You know SPSS does most of the math for you. But just make sure you're on the right data set, you're answering the correct question, read the questions, you know, and make sure that you've got all of that because you'll, you know, that's a quick way to lose points. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because it happened to me on the, on the last quiz. I, I think the I'm fine with the questions, but it, it just, I don't have enough time to answer all of, the, all of them. <laughs> yeah. I, I have about three minutes or two minutes left to answer the rest of the questions. So I think uh, for the finals that will help out. Yeah. 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 Well, the final is designed to be really a low stress kind of exam, but, but in, keep in mind there's a lot of work. So what I recommend to my students usually, you know, try to do at least one problem a day, you know, so and then you can kind of yeah. go back and look at it again and whatever, you know, it's kind of sometimes good to think about the problem for a couple of days, you know, if, you, if you're not sure what, what you need to do. But anyway, um, so I understand that some people cannot do that because of their, you know, other obligations, but it's, it's a good thing if you can. Every day spend a little bit of time on that final exam, you know, so, so that yep. you, know, you can make good progress on it. Um, um, last question, uh, with, with, well, the, um, with regards with the dissertation and everything, uh, mm -hmm. with, with our pa papers, with the uh, is statistics involved? Are we the one who's going to to generate the statistics, or is there some some help that we could get from Walden to in order to establish our data and interpretation? Have you have you gone through any residencies yet? Uh, I did just my first one this year. This yeah. my first this my first year, so yeah, I'm just wondering about that. You'll get you'll get a lot more information, and as the as the residencies progress, you'll get even more information. Um, a lot of it will depend on your topic and your committee. There's a lot of a lot of ground to be covered before you have to start worrying about that. Okay. So, you know, I mean, if if you know you're going to be doing a quantitative analysis, then you know it's a really good idea to be you know getting you know, good at SPSS. You know, some people do qualitative uh, dissertations, and the, you know they don't do as much with the with the uh, statistics. So again, it's, yeah. it's going to kind of depend on your topic and how you approach that dissertation. But you have a oh. lot of time to be be thinking that through. And some of the other courses that you take, you'll start you know looking at different aspects that you can apply to your to your dissertation. All right, thank you. Any other final thoughts or questions? I submitted two questions. This is uh, okay. Italia Bergenthal. Yeah. I, I, did, I don't you... see them. Mm. Uh-oh. I don't know. I, I don't sent them. <laughs> oh, uh, Patrick Dragon, uh, I'm just uh, um, uh, is this part of PowerPoint presentation will be available for us on the study group uh, area for um, us. Yeah, we can we can make it available, right, Pat? Or is it how? Is yeah, it? yeah, we can do that, and we'll uh, we'll also make the recording available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I can provide like it. In, your, uh, yeah. It looks like I'm okay. One of the questions was, can we start downloading the exams now? No, you'll get the. Um, the final exam, uh, I believe, on the Wednesday of week 11. Right, right. So you will and, not know any questions until then. Uh, looks like I'm having a hard time with the um, the question was about Turnitin. Let me see. Let me go back. Oh. 
Oh, there were questions. I wasn't seeing them. Sorry about that. Patrick. Yeah, I don't see, I don't see yeah. any questions on my end here. Hmm. Patrick. Yes. Um, for the final methodology, it would be, is it based on maybe like uh, five uh, five ordinal scales uh, with multiple choices, or uh, my question was, uh, do we oh, anticipate the, that final? we need references for the answers? Yeah, for the final test. Yeah, uh, like in, you the, the final is going to be very similar to your weekly application. You will not need to provide references other than what you learned in the course. I see. Okay, I'm okay. seeing questions. Um, yeah, we will we'll, we will make the PowerPoint and the uh, and the recording available. Um, oh, so the final is in a PowerPoint presentation. No, 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 no. The this PowerPoint from today, the the final. Um, will be in a, a Word document. Word document, okay, great. And uh, as was as you answered the other question of my friend over there, that uh, the time limitation there is no timing like we do on regular quizzes, where you know That's you correct. don't really have time sometimes to answer. So we've got ten days to answer. Is that correct? Correct. All right. All right. So then my other question is. I um I could not find the, the variables that we need. They're missing for the uh, assignment 7.2 to do the uh, analysis of the variances. Do you have I, the, the data, data set? The data set is, uh, yes, I have the data set. But then when I started trying to analyze it in the SPSS, uh, there is no information that I, that I need. So if you go to the um, the step by step guide, yes, I did. I finished the seven point one, but the seven point two, I could not find any any information. Information is missed. For seven point two, what you're going to yes. want to do, um, you know, this is an example from a different data set, but just follow the steps. Uh, I try to, but you know, but before I can input into SPSS, there's not enough information for 7.2. Uh, what you, what I may suggest, um, whoever your peer mentor is, I'm not sure which course you're in. Um, check with your yeah, peer mentor. Yeah, it's that. It's that It's oh, right. okay. So I, I ordered. Are you talking, about, are you talking about problem 7.2 on the application? Yeah, 7.2, yeah. yeah, application, oh, okay. which so is due on Sunday. So you need to open that uh, uh, mob underscore BW data set. And you have two variables there okay. when you open that. They, you have a group and then you have weight. OK. So you have all you need because you're going to be looking at the difference of weight, mean weight in those four groups. You have four groups total. And the birth weight. Right, right. The birth weight, yeah. Yep, yep. Where did you find that? It's in the smoke underscore bw dot sav data set. Oh, it's, it's still under the seven point one. Okay. Well, I was looking for the seven at seven. No, it's gonna be in the. It's gonna be in the data set. Yeah, I posted that data set at the beginning of this week's discussion. Point did, you, one. did you find that? No. At the very beginning of our study group? Yeah. Yeah, I posted both of the data sets. My data set this is, is the data with, set. Um, Dragon gave it at the study group in the beginning. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it should be there. Yeah, I I have the data set, but I need the variables. The variables so anyway, are the group and weight. Yeah, you have two. You start, have two variables. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah, right. yeah, that's all you need for that problem. Okay. Sounds good. You see how it, there's there's four different groups. 
that's how it's doing the ANOVA. So it's comparing yeah. group one, two, three, and four. Right. Okay. okay. Got it. Well, thank you. All right. Any final thoughts from anybody? How often can you do this more often? Because these, this is great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it you know, helps a lot. Do is do one. We, we will we usually do one right before the final. Yeah. Because, so maybe yeah. in like week eleven, we'll do another one. Will Will it be oh, just like a good. review of the of the whole course or what? Yeah, it'll be a review yeah. for the final exam. Um, what's the scope of the of the next webinar? Will it be a, a kind of like a review of the whole course? Which we're going to be covered on the final exam, or yeah, yeah exactly. The final, the final covers the entire course, so we will review virtually the entire course. All right, that's cool. in that webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you for doing this. This is really great. We're great. Yes. Great. <laughs> it was great. Alrighty, thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Hey, bye.